All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, good early morning, everybody, in some cases. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are super excited because this week, leading up to Saturday's Oceans Day, is World Oceans Week. And we are celebrating, as always, by doing a huge slew of hangouts with some of the best marine educators and scientists from around the world. 25 sessions uh, from <laughs> Monday through Friday. Our sixth class just joined us. See, everyone's all excited. Um, all right, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our classes and then we can get underway. We've got Ms. Wilson's class, not yet here, waiting for the bell. Grade sixes in Walkerton, Ontario. Hi, guys. Come and check with them when they're back in. We've got Miss Dylan's grade five and sixes in Farmington, Missouri. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. We've got Miss Searson's grade threes in Douglas, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey. We've got Mr. Trozzi's grade fives in Canastota, New York. Hi, guys. Hi. Huh? We've got Miss Wertheim's grade twos in Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, <laughs> bar for excitement. And then last but not least, just joining us a second ago, we've got Miss Leister's grade fours in Dover in New Jersey. Hi, guys. Your mic's off for some strange reason, but that's a tech issue, and we'll sort that out later. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here is for our speaker. So we are joined live in New York City by Galen Rosenwax. So she is a marine scientist, an educator, an explorer. Uh, she has done work all over the world, from the frozen seas of the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea to tropical Palau and Belize and a whole lot more. Uh, she's joined us more than almost anyone in our history as, a, as an individual scientist, so we're so excited to have her back to kick off our World Oceans Week. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Galen, and take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me this morning to kick off World Oceans Week. Very excited to be sharing some stories with you and to take you on an adventure throughout my favorite place in the world, the ocean. Uh, so we're gonna just, um, I have to, I'm gonna just start my presentation right away so we get through everything. So just bear with me as I try to share my screen so you can see my presentation and see some cool pictures. All right, so here we go. We're gonna go on a journey. So here I am on top of the Bering Sea, on top of some sea ice, taking a photograph of the edge. There's open water, and then I'm just about on a foot of ice. So we'll get back there in a second. We're gonna go on a journey all over the world. Don't worry, in 20 minutes, I can't take you everywhere. We're just gonna go to some of my first, my favorite spots. Um, so we're gonna start in the Antarctic that big white blob at the bottom of our globe that I always thought was so incredible and I always wanted to go there. And I got to spend two months on an expedition on an icebreaker down there. This was the ship that was my home for the two months. Here it is parked in front of Palmer Station in the sea ice. Um, and we had really rough seas. The Drake Passage when we left from Chile and went down to the Antarctic is known for its very rough seas. It's one of the roughest spots on the planet. And it definitely, it definitely supplied us some rough seas. But once we got there, we were still in pretty rough seas, but then we ended up in sea ice. So here I am on the ship going through this solid ice. And it was so neat to be moving through something that was just completely solid. So just an unlike any other experience. And I had never done that before. It was really early in my career and it definitely changed my mind about everything going on in the ocean. But what was I doing there? I wasn't just there for a cruise, although that would have been pretty neat. I was there studying krill and copepods, which are the basis of the food chain. So this is a krill, it's a little shrimp-like creature, and this is a copepod. So copepods are smaller than krill, but essentially they are the main source of food for almost everything in the Antarctic. And they're very important in the entire ocean, but in the Antarctic krill are particularly important. And we were studying what they were hap what was happening to them in the winter. Where were they going? What were they doing? So what that meant was that I got to collect a lot of krill. So here I am cleaning off a net um, to, to collect our organisms that we were studying. And then we got to look at what everything was. And then we got to a really southern part of the cruise. And this was actually the only day that we saw the sun in two months. And here I am in front of an iceberg. So it's pretty neat to actually be working in a place that was so stunningly beautiful and just unlike anywhere on the planet. And just really opened my eyes to the possibilities of what was out there in the world. And we got to see little creatures, big creatures as well, not just the little guys. So in a deli penguin over here, they're eating the plankton. And here's an elephant seal that would eat the fish that was eating that were eating plankton. It's the one day that we got off of the ship. 
So now I'm going to switch gears because the Antarctic was amazing, but I also love fish. And I grew up fishing, and I always had wanted to study and learn more about this incredible fish, the Atlantic bluefin tuna. So this is actually a Pacific bluefin in the picture, but I just love it. But they look very similar. So why Atlantic bluefin tuna? Well, again, I'm back up in rough, rough seas. And, um, but bluefin tuna are so cool because they can go everywhere in the ocean because they are warm blooded. They swim really fast and they get really big up to 1500 pounds. So like the size of a small car, they live for over 30 years and they can regulate their internal body temperatures, which means that they can go anywhere they want to in the ocean if it's warm or if it's cold. Most people care about tuna. They've been because they like to eat them. But we like to care about them because they're just beautiful, incredible animals. The Greek In ancient Greece, they used to think they were really important too. So what did we do with the tunas? We wanted to learn about where they were going in the ocean so that we could keep them in the ocean for the future. So we went out and we caught fish, we caught the tunas, we brought them on deck, and then we would do surgery on them. We would put in tags into their bellies to see where they were going and what they were doing when the places that they went went to and we'd also put satellite tags on them i know a lot of people now are following where all the different sharks and turtles are going on all of the different apps well this sort of predated all of that and we would get these amazing emails with all of our data so we would put these satellite tags on the fish and then we would put the fish out the door and it would become this like amazing data collecting machine. So not only teaching us about the fish, but also about the ocean around it. So we got these really cool maps when they came back, when we got the data. So here we tagged a fish in North Carolina and it crossed the entire Atlantic Ocean in less than a month. So if you think about that, you think about how long a boat takes to get across the Atlantic Ocean, that's a couple of weeks. And here the tunas are getting across in the same amount of time, just a little bit longer. So really amazing animals. But at the same time I was learning all about this and I was learning about the ocean, I decided I wanted to like kind of switch gears and get back into really cold places. So I went back up to the Arctic because I just love exploring and I wanted to just see more of the world and learn more about every corner of the ocean so that I could really understand what was happening. So I ended up on another icebreaker up in the Bering Sea. And here's the icebreaker Healy. It's a Coast Guard vessel parked in the ice up in the northern part of the Bering Sea. So here's the Bering Sea for those that don't know. And uh, so we flew into Anchorage, Alaska, and then we took a small plane to St. Paul Island, where we then um, jumped on a helicopter, got onto the ship, and then headed north into the Bering Sea. So this is where we landed in St. Paul in the middle of winter. So again, really, really cold. There's a trend in all of my work, but you'll see, we'll switch gears shortly. Um, we work 24 hours a day on a ship. So there's no rest for the weary on these things. So the snow is snowed every day. And here we got on the ship and we hit the ground running to collect some organisms. And here we're using nets to collect, again, my favorites, krill and copepods, the basis of the food chain. Just like in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, they're also very, very important for the food chain. So here we were, I was photographing and filming. These We were taking bottom cores. We were looking at the whole ecosystem up there, which was so cool. So everything from the bottom of the ocean to the water column, up through the water. So here we were collecting water samples in the ice. So this, or, this um, apparatus here, it collects water in different depths and it also measures what's happening with the temperature and the salinity so we can really understand what's happening in the world below the surface. So we know what's happening in the air above us and we get the temperature and humidity and things. So in the ocean, we wanna know about chemistry and we wanna know what's happening in the ocean so we can understand why the animals are where they are and what's happening in the ecosystem. As we got farther and farther north, we got into thicker and thicker ice, which I love. There's two things that I love. I love big fish and I love sea ice so this expedition was really exciting um, so as you see the ice is newly forming and then we got into thicker and thicker ice until we got into such thick ice that we were actually parked the ship in the ice and here i am holding up the ship because i am that strong and now i'm going to show you a little video so that you can feel what it's like to go through the ice on one of these big vessels <laughs> pretty exciting. It was sunny a few minutes ago, but uh, now the clouds came in and it's starting to snow. And uh, we should get into thicker ice later, but it's nice that uh, first got nice during the day so we could check it out.
pretty beautiful. You can hear the ice breaking underneath the ship. Pretty amazing. We're in a frozen ocean and uh, basically what the cruise itself is trying to find out is what's going to happen to the organisms with less ice. So what kind of nutrients are in the water from the melting ice and if it really affects the blooming of the phytoplankton and then in turn the calanus and the copepods and on up to the benthic areas. And it's um, really interesting stuff. There's ice everywhere. Oh, it's pretty thick ice now. It's probably about a foot thick, which isn't too thick. There's certainly thick ice that we've been going through. But right now, I think it's probably about one to two feet thick. If you're really feeling shaky, it makes a lot of noise. warm and just in case the ice breaks for some reason we fall in. But uh so those three solid I think they said it's about thirty eight centimeters thick, so a little over a foot. Um I eight down it was on underneath it was really um, salty and kind of pond scummy because it's filled with ice out. It's a really important part of the ecosystem here. We've got a guy out here watching from polar bears. In case someone comes up, we have to like hightail it to the ship. That's the ice edge right there. Pretty neo. So as you can see, we were doing lots of really cool science on the ship um, and on the ice. And for me, it was really exciting because I had spent two months in the Antarctic looking at all of that ice that we never got off of the ship. So to be out there, it was really fun. Then the entire crew actually gets off of the ship too and we were playing soccer and it was like a really fun afternoon. So, but what we were looking, we were looking at the ice core. So just an up close, here's that ice algae that I spoke about in the video. And here it is as it was melting. So a very important part of the ecosystem. Once we were finished with all of our data sampling, we pulled out of our parking spot and started moving along. And here we got to see some really cool walruses. One of the really neat things about being on a ship is you, sp you cover a lot of ground, so you see lots of cool stuff. One of the frustrating things is that it's always from a distance. You don't get up close and personal with everything. But really neat to see walruses. It was the first time I had seen them in the wild and just frolicking along in the sea ice. Like, it was so cold. Newly forming ice, this is um, pancake ice, which is really cool. It's one of my favorite things to see when you're in the cold, cold water. Now we're going to switch gears. So I love the cold, but I've been really fortunate to start working in really warm, beautiful places. And why is that important? Well, everywhere on our planet is facing a lot of the same issues. So we're looking at how our changing climate and our warming is going to affect everything from less sea ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic to what's going to happen to the corals in Palau. So I made a little I made a film recently and here I'm going to take you on a little journey through the film. This is the beginning Coral of the film. Is a super organism. This is the one major ecosystem on the planet that's founded on an animal. There are over 800 species of reef building corals across the globe. All of them have found a remarkable way to exist as the planet's only solar powered animal. How can this be possible? So I was really lucky because I could switch gears and now I can ask very similar questions to what I was doing in the Arctic, but I could do that now in this beautiful coral reef ecosystem of Palau, looking at how the living, this gorgeous, but extremely diverse 
um, ecosystem is going to respond to the threats that it's facing with our warming temperatures that we hear about all the time. So these scientists were doing incredible work. You can watch the whole film. It's actually available on YouTube. It's an eight minute little mini doc. So if you want to learn about corals and everything, but here's just some pictures from it. And so the coral diversity in Palau is absolutely incredible. And we've got inshore and offshore corals and different ecosystems and a really interesting living laboratory here in one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. So this is in the inshore areas, um, just a tremendous diversity of coral, lots and lots of different species. So then I'm also gonna switch gears because the surface waters are cool and it's awesome to be in sea ice, but I was super lucky to do my first expedition ever with submarines back in December. And here we were diving the great blue hole in Belize. So we were up living on this ship for a couple of weeks and then we would come in here and we would go down in sub submarines to the bottom of this great blue hole. So here I'm gonna just show you some pictures. So these were the two submarines that we were using. We were using the Aquatica submarine Stingray and then I got to go in the Idabel, which was a deep sea sub, really cool. This was the team that we were doing. It was on Discovery Channel back in December. And here I am about to go on my first sub dive down in the Idabel into the bottom of the blue hole. And I'm gonna take you guys along on that journey right now. So as you're in a submarine, it's very weird because you only have the view out of the window that's in front of you. So here's the porthole that I got to sort of uh, look out of for those six hours that I was in the sub and see what I could see, but you never sort of knew what was behind the sub. Uh, but as we went down, we got to dive both submarines together. So here I'm taking a picture of the other sub. And as we're going down into the blue hole, into the abyss, it was pretty neat to sort of get that feeling. So here we're going down, down, down. And here's a picture from the other submarine. I'm actually in this submarine. So one of the cool things about being in the blue hole is all of the crazy rock formations all around. You're basically in a submerged cave that no longer has a top. So the, all of the geology and the rocks and all of that, super cool. We also did some scuba dives in there. So here I am scuba diving the next day just for scale so you can see how big everything is around. And we were also using a lot of ROVs, so remote operated vehicles, these little mini robots. So this expedition was really neat because we were using a lot of really advanced technology to explore this new spot. Here, I'm just going to show you a video. I'm actually in the submarine taking this out of that porthole as we're going through these amazingly huge stalactites. So if you think about it, I'm in that submarine going through this just for scale. If you can think about how big this is, this are, this cave is really neat. But as we went down, we would see some animals coming, coming out of the darkness. And if you see, wait for one second and you're going to see there's going to be a shark coming right here. See him? And so he just kind of came into our lights and scurried out. So it was really neat to see. As we went down, this was around 300 feet. We saw this enormous hermit crab and he was having a standoff with the sub. Definitely one of my favorite moments. And as we went down, we get to this layer of hydrogen sulfide, which is kind of thick and gooey. And then we had to go down below it. And it was super eerie as we went down. So you can see we're just going through this layer. And then once we got below the layer, it clears up and we saw that there's not any oxygen down there, very little oxygen. So any animal from the surface that gets down there dies, unfortunately. So we would see conch shells and here we can see along the bottom. And then we would see all these different markings from different things, but it was mostly just sand and silt. And so we also came upon a lot of trash. So here you can see there's a scuba fin and a bottle at the bottom. And that's one of the problems that we're facing in the ocean right now is a lot of plastic pollution. So we need to figure out how to keep all of this plastic out of the ocean so that we can have a healthy system in years to come. And then once the dive was done, we kind of go back up to the surface. And here I'm just gonna show you a video of what it feels like to go burst out of the water. Boom, pretty neat. And then I was very happy to be back up on the sub. So, and that's the sub pilot, Carl Stanley. So then I'm gonna switch gears and I'm just gonna show you some really cool wildlife pictures from some of my more recent projects as well. Here's a flying fish flying out of the water at my head. I had just gone in the water with some sperm whales and I was waiting for the boat to pick me up and it just kind of flew at me and I was lucky enough to get that image. And here's the largest tooth predator on the planet, sperm whales. 
I've got an obsession right now with big predators. So I'm spending as much time as I can with things like sperm whales and orcas and great white sharks. Here's some pictures from Guadalupe Island in Mexico. Hammerhead sharks in Bimini. This one just kind of sneak attacked me and photobombed me as my friend was taking a picture. Uh, just really beautiful animals. Such a privilege to be in the water with them. Um, and here's some blue sharks in our local waters off of Montauk where I get to live. I get to live surrounded by incredible wildlife. Um, and just really neat to be in the water with these guys too. They're so sleek and beautiful. Around here, we also have a lot of seals. So I just wanted to show you some of my favorite seal pictures because you know, outside of all of our doors, there's always wildlife. There's always things to see, whether you live in a city or you live in the country. Um, really incredible stuff. Some sea lions from British Columbia, another favorite spot of mine on the planet. Um, just really incredible animals. Everybody always loves the otter because they're so cute. It was World Otter Day a few days ago. Some dolphins, just happy dolphins to end. And here's a family of dolphins also in our local waters here in New York. So now I'm going to end. Um, I'm going to end there and take some questions. Uh, so we'll get out of the screen share, hopefully. Let's see. Did that work? No. You, at the very bottom of your screen, to st there you go, you're back. Perfect. Well, yeah, that would you. We couldn't have kicked off Ocean's Week any better than that. What a cool <laughs> exploration of all the world. And and for the classes, just so you guys know too, uh, so few people in human history have ever got a chance to go down into a deep sea sub. Like it's maybe in the low thousands, but in history, that's a, a very rare experience. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, my pleasure. And we were actually the first ones um, after Jacques Cousteau in the 70s to go down to the bottom of the Blue Hall. Super cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Before we dive into questions, I want to note too, there's about seven groups watching on YouTube live. So if you guys want to type in questions, I will pass them along. Please do do that. Don't be shy. But let's start with our new class joining us for the first time, Miss Wilson's group. Uh, if you guys have a question for Galen, come on up. I have another question. Feeling great. Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> a little shy on our first, on our first yeah. Or, little shy Thursday. Well, let's go to another class and we'll come back in just a minute, okay? Uh, so, Miss Dylan's class, if you guys have a question. Uh, we do. Who has a shark question? Uh, yeah, come on up. Come, come right up here, buddy. This is our first day of summer school in our first hour, so. Wow, well, we appreciate you joining us for it. All right, tell them your name and then just say hi. Here's the camera right here, buddy. <laughs> My name is Carson, and how do sharks live all the way down there? There's a lot of pressure. Yeah, so that shark actually, so it was super, um, it was around 100 feet, so not that much pressure. But different animals will adapt in different ways, and unlike a lot of animals, sharks don't have a swim bladder, so they actually have um, oil that helps them with their buoyancy um, that's in their liver. So they can go quite deep. But and that picture where you saw in the from the sub, it we were only around 100 to 150 feet, so still quite near the surface. Just a quick follow up on that. So you showed sperm whales near the end too. So there's an animal that can go incredibly far down. Can you explain a little bit about what they can do? Yeah, well, sperm whales can dive super deep, and they they're mammals, so they actually hold their breath, right? Because they have to breathe air. So it's pretty neat what they do. They have all sorts of crazy physical adaptations so that they can dive thousands of feet down to get their giant squid and things that they hunt um, down in the depths in these deep canyons. And where I was in Dominica, there's this big, deep canyon that kind of comes out from one of the rivers, and that's where they go down to hunt for their um, giant squid. Super cool. Uh, all right, Miss Searson's class. Right. Miss class. Miss Searson's class. Miss Um, what would happen if you got stuck in the middle of the sea? In the middle of the ice. In the middle of the sea? Yeah, or the, or the ice. Yeah, or the, or the, the ice. ice. The ice. Yeah. Oh, we got stuck in the ice. Well, so the ship is equipped to keep us, you know, sustained with food and heat and plenty of gas for months at a time. Because certainly ships do get stuck in the ice in the Antarctic and the Arctic. Um, but fortunately, we didn't get stuck. But if you do get stuck, you kind of just have to wait until the wind shifts and the the um, you get like a lead in the ice so that you can go. So the way that these icebreakers work is they do something called backing and ramming. So they back up and they get a lot of power. They have like 12 engines. And then you go on top of the ice and the weight of the hull of the ship 
breaks the ice. So you need enough space to sort of go back and forth. And so if you get stuck, basically you have to just wait until the wind shifts and all of that ice sort of moves. Everything's moving in the sea ice with currents and with the winds. So you can get stuck. Um, we always hope that we don't get stuck, obviously, but you have plenty of food and plenty of water um, to survive for a long time. So, and then you can always try to get reinforcements in to break up the ice. But the Healy, the ship that I was on, was our largest icebreaker in the US. So we would need reinforcements from other countries if we got stuck in that ship. But hopefully that won't happen. And if it does, hopefully it won't, would it be for too long? Very cool. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, Miss uh, Retrosi's class, if you guys have a question. Mm -hmm. How did some of the animals around the coral reefs adapt to the coral reef? Did you catch that, Galen? I did not. Can you repeat it? Yeah, sorry. How did some of the animals around the coral reefs adapt to the coral reef? So how did some of the animals adapt to being on the coral reef? Yeah. How do they survive the coral area? Yeah, so corals are one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. And most of the animals that live on and around coral reefs evolved to live on coral reefs. So they sort of developed together. So they didn't necessarily just come and decide like, oh, I want to live on a coral reef. Like we would do that because we're like, wow, corals are amazing. We want to live there. It's so beautiful. But the animals that live on coral reefs sort of came up and developed alongside of the reef. So that's where they belong. That's where they live. So they just lucked out really because, you know, there's lots of animals that live in, you know, well, I mean, everywhere on the earth is so amazing that it has animals, but you know, we've got, you know, things that live in the like, seagrass and things, other places, but the coral reefs are just so beautiful and so diverse. So just depending on, um, most animals are very specific in the wild to where they need to live. Um, and so they sort of, come up and evolve together. Very cool. Uh, all right, Miss Wertheim's class, your mic and video are off, but I assume you're still here with us. So Asheville, if you guys have a question. Yes, Hi. Yes, we are still here. And we do have a question, go ahead. Hi, my name is Maxine, and I was wondering what was the scariest animal you've seen? Mm. The scariest animal? Yes. Ooh. Honestly, I think the scariest animal I've ever seen is a sea wasp jellyfish. Mm. They're really beautiful, so I'm not going to say like, oh, I don't want to see another one. But they're one of those things where like if they sting you, they can actually do a lot of harm. So you don't want to you want to see them from afar. You don't want them like to touch you or anything like that. But they're a really important part of the ecosystem because they're a predator, but they actually can harm you. So in a way that you don't always see them, you know, because they're sort of smaller and clear um, that they're called the deadly sea wasps for a reason, because they can sting you. And I'm quite allergic to things like bees and other things like that. So that's also why they kind of scare me more than maybe the average person who's not allergic, because I could have a really bad reaction to them. Yeah. Where do you see the sea wasp? Where was that? So it's all in warm water. I saw one in the Florida Keys, actually, but it's only certain times of year and um, certainly not common. Yeah. So, you know, like box jelly, box jellyfish in the Australia. So there's a few jellyfish that kind of scare me the most, I think. Interesting. Uh, all right, uh, Miss Lacer's class. So your mic, I have you as unmuted, but you're muted. So on the top of your screen, if you just click the mute button, you should be good to talk. There you go, yes, perfect. Um, where did you go to college and what was your first job as a scientist? Ooh, a good one. So I went to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for college and I studied biology and I minored in art history because I love art as well. Um, when I finished there before I went to graduate school and I went to graduate school at Duke, but my first job was right out of undergrad and that's when I worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and I was a guest investigator in a lab studying biology and that's the expedition that i went to antarctica was while i was working um in between the year between um undergraduate and graduate school so that was my first job i got to study southern ocean so oh. job i could never have you know asked for more but it was really cool awesome 
we had a, a class on the line on YouTube typing pretty much the exact same question. So if you guys at Hilson uh, Avenue and in, in, in Ottawa want to pass along another question, please do. Uh, in the meantime, we got a question from uh, uh, Miss Soto's class in San Antonio, Texas, which wants to know, why do whale sharks have to eat small fish? Or just in general, why do big creatures eat these small organisms? Right. It's super interesting, right, how most of our large, mar large animals really are, you know, eating plankton in the ocean, right? So you've got blue whales eating plankton, we've got whale sharks eating plankton, basking sharks, mega male sharks, everything's eating small things and they're filter feeding it out. It's because in terms of it's found expending energy to hunt, if you're gonna get that big, they just sort of go through the water with their mouths wide open and get all of the food that they need. And fortunately, our oceans, every speck of the ocean is filled with food for these animals. So obviously they need to get like, higher concentration so that's why we see the whale sharks sort of aggregating where fish are spawning a lot of the times because they'll eat the fish eggs so there's a big aggregation of whale sharks in isla mujeres in mexico because the little tunny are spawning so you've got all of the fish eggs and the gametes and everything in the water that they're very nutrient rich so they're going through and just gobbling it all up um so they all they really have to do is swim which they're doing anyway and then open it and then they've got all of their you know specialized um mouth parts and filter feeding organisms like in whales you've got baleen to sort of get all of that stuff into their bellies super cool uh that actually leads really nicely into the question we got again from uh, ottawa uh, as a second online question which is how many species of krill are there are the krill in the arctic the same as the ones in the antarctic or are they different what's what's going on um, there are a few different species of krill. The ones in the Antarctic are called Euphausia superba because they're quite large. One thing that's really neat in the Antarctic about the plankton is it's all massive compared to other plankton. Now, massive plankton is still very tiny, but a krill in the Antarctic is probably about that large, so about you know two and a half to three inches when it's an adult, and most other krill is quite is small, about an inch. So that's like one of the larger larger plankton. We'll call those macrozooplankton, and so but everything in the Antarctic is um, big in terms of plankton. So your copepods are bigger. That's the other picture that I showed you, and then you've got all these other really neat organisms, but everything's bigger. Um, and so there are multiple species of, um, of krill in the different oceans. But my favorite is definitely the Antarctic krill, the Euphausia superba. If your presentation didn't give it away already, your answer to that question shows how much you love your job. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let's head back to Ms. Wilson's class. If you guys have a question now, uh, you seem like... Oh, yeah. Um... Yep, you're good. Oh, you guys cut out. Let's see. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, so come back up. For whatever reason, it cut out the moment you came up. So come up and tell us that again. Sorry. <laughs> Uh-oh, I can't hear. It's not catching, guys. Aquatic animal. So Let's Ms. try again. Yeah, Miss Wilson, can you repeat that for us? Sorry. Maybe it's not. I don't know. What is the deepest diving aquatic animal? Yes. Perfect. Deepest Great. diving aquatic animal. Well, so we've got so it we've got mammals that dive quite deep, and we've got fish that dive quite deep, and then we've got animals that live in the deepest parts of the ocean, right? So there are fish in the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean in the Challenger Deep. Um, then we've also got, you know, sperm whales and seals and sea lions that dive quite deep as well, thousands and thousands of feet, and they're mammals. So mammals, we're mammals. So that's quite impressive because they've actually got air and they've got all sorts of specialized um, blood and so that and their lungs can shrink and they can um, they have this, they can go quite deep and then there's also fish that you know normally would be at the surface that go down. So I would say that probably the deepest of the mammals is certainly like the sperm whale and then there's some uh, seals that also go quite deep. Um, but the cool thing is that we don't really even know because we don't know enough about the ocean. And not only that, but a lot of the tag technology that we have that we'll learn from can't go as deep. So we'll, like, it'll cut out at its depth max and then we won't know if it went way deeper. So it's not a concrete answer to your question, but it's a very sciencey answer that there's still things to learn. 
there's so much more to explore. It's uh, something that comes up in every ocean hangout, so I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> also, sperm whales have been brought up a few times now, so you just have to picture this 60-foot titan going down into ocean trenches to hunt the largest invertebrate on Earth in like this epic battle, and that is pretty awesome. Uh, all right, you know what, Miss Wilson's class, let's go back to you guys for a second question, and then we'll go back down one by one. Um, hopefully we can get it first time this time. So if you guys have a second question, any student, uh, feel free to come on up. Tegan, do you want to go up? Yeah, audio is tricky in that class, guys. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. One more time, yeah. What was your favorite animal? Perfect. Oh, my favorite animal. That's a really hard question. No pressure. <laughs> uh, because I really love everything in the ocean, but I would say that if I had to answer the bluefin tuna, they're definitely my favorite, um, or one of my favorites. Uh, they're just incredible animals. You know, they are. They get really big. They can go everywhere in the ocean. They're endothermic physiologically. They've got these. They're hydrodynamic. Their fins sort of they turn into this, like bullet, and they can so swim so fast. They jump out of the water. They're voracious predators. They're just really cool. And my favorite mammal in the ocean is an orca. I think orcas are just super awesome. Your orca speech did not match up to your bluefin tuna speech. but I know, but I was trying to be fast. Oh, yes. Well, we <laughs> love it for a sight. That's, uh, and that's the first time we've ever had bluefin tuna as an answer to that question. So <laughs> All right. Uh, Miss Dylan's class, if you guys have a second question, come on back up. Why is it called Pancake Eyes? Well, so, good question, because I actually like to call it Scallop Potato Ice, because it looks like scallop potatoes to me, because I'm usually hungry on these expeditions. But it's called Pancake Ice because it looks like pancakes. So it's round and small, sort of the size of a pancake. Okay. So, and it becomes those shapes because of the way that the wind goes, right? So all of the ice is formed and the wind's going, and so for some reason, that's, that's the first the first stage in sea ice development. And if you pour maple syrup on it, it makes a great popsicle as well. <laughs> uh, all right, Miss Searson's class, Miss Searson's class. Have you seen a lot of garbage underwater? Yes. So it's actually one of the biggest things that um, I talk about now and that I'm working on now is trying to solve the plastic pollution problem. We see so much ocean plastics everywhere. I actually it was just last week um, left on a another project um, out of Bermuda, and we went out into the North Atlantic gyre to look for plastic. And everywhere we went, floating on the surface was plastic. And in the bottom, as you saw in the bottom of the blue hole, there was plastic. And unfortunately now, pretty much everywhere you go, you're going to see plastic, whether it's tiny or it's big. So we were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean looking at sargassum weed, um, which is like this floating seaweed that you get in the Atlantic Ocean. And we found a toilet seat just hanging out on top of the plastic, on top of the, you know, this like amazing habitat in the middle of the ocean and all sorts of other plastic. Um, everything from bottles to toilet seats to toothbrushes. Um, and really, we need to figure out how to use less plastic. So to that end, and we, we spent all September covering ocean plastic as well, uh, what are things that kids can do to actually prevent plastic waste getting in the ocean themselves? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And it's something that what I like, what I think the interesting thing about the plastic is some, it is something that we can do individually. So. The one thing we can do is try to not use a lot of single use plastic, right? So plastic water bottles, use a refillable water bottle and fill it from the tap. We have great drinking water in North America. So it's, a you know, and it's clean and you can get filters for your homes and things. But so a refillable water bottle is one. Don't not to use straws because, you know, or to get a reusable straw as well. Because um, plastic straw, I mean, do we really have to use it every time? Probably not, you know. Um, but they do make really cool reusable straws now, too, that are metal, and they can be washed, and they're pretty neat. Um, and they look cool. And I've seen some that are, like, rainbow metal, so that's pretty neat, too. You can, you know, accessorize with your straw and your water bottle. Um, and then to always use, you know, to try to use just less single use. So bring your grocery bag 
to the grocery or have your parents bring your grocery uh, grocery bags to the grocery store instead of using plastic bags. I mean, it's so much easier, you know? I mean, I live in New York City, so I'm always carrying my groceries and to use a canvas tote is just so much more efficient. You can fit more in it and then they last for a long time. So it's really nice um, to do that. And then you don't, you reduce what you throw in the trash. The other thing to do is to make sure that you recycle all of the plastics that you do use. Certain things are going to be in single use plastics. And so we need to try to recycle everything that we can and find the proper way to do so. So it doesn't end up in the ocean. Great answer. Uh, all right, before we do our last three classes that are live, I just want to pass along one more question from Hilson Avenue in Ottawa, which is what happens to the tag in the tuna? Does it pop out by itself? Does it stay in there forever? What's going on? So we have two different types of tags that we use. One is an internal tag and the fish actually has to be um, caught in order to get the tag back. So the problem, one of the things with bluefin in particular is that there's a lot of fishing pressure on the tunas so that they are caught and killed to go to fish markets because they're very highly valued. And so that tag will then be sent back to us for reward by the fishermen. So that's really cool that we get it. Not so cool that the fish has to die, obviously, but we do get this incredible data. And by it being inside the fish, we get more data. So it's a valuable resource. And then the other tags we use, the satellite tags, we actually program them to pop off of the fish at a certain time so that it's got this little pin in it and we sell it on this day, maybe six months to a year after we put it on. It's gonna burn through the pin, the tag's gonna float to the surface, it's got a little float on top, and then it's gonna transmit to the satellite. And then all of a sudden we get an email in our inbox and it's so exciting with all of the data saying that the tag is transmitting a couple of days later, it transmits for a few days, and then we get to look at all of that data. So it's really, it's probably the most exciting email to get, to be honest with you. And then you get to like look at all of the tracks and look at all of the data. Super cool. Uh, all right, let's head to Ms. Rotosi's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. What can we do to save coral reefs? So that is a really hard question because coral reefs, so there's a, re there's a few reasons why it's such a hard question. And I think then we can start thinking about the possible solutions. One, it's extremely diverse and it's very sensitive to change. So, you know, you've got all of these species, we've got all of these things interacting. So if we take out a predator, that's going to change the entire ecosystem dynamic. And if we, you know, add something in, it's also going to change. So in the Caribbean, we're seeing, you know, lionfish come in and that's an invasive species that's throwing off the ecosystem balance. So one thing we can do is try to protect these systems so that they're as resilient as possible, which means that they're healthy and that if a, some sort of, you know, stress comes in, that they are in their best top form to sort of react to this stress. And then they can, you know, adapt slightly. So, you know, it's a kind of like when we don't feel like if we get sick, but if we can like eat really properly and like hydrate properly and do all of that, then we're less likely to get sick and we wash our hands, you know, in between doing things then we're less likely to get sick. So it's the same thing for coral reefs or anywhere in the ocean. If we keep it a healthy ecosystem, then when stress comes in and, or, you know, something comes in that there's going to be more likely to survive that stress. The other thing is now we are noticing that there's like a lot of toxins that we're putting in. So if we can try not to do that, so like people with sunscreens and things like that, using reef safe sunscreens, that's important. And then also when you're on the reef, not to touch it, because if you're touching the reef, then that's, you know, taking off a protective layer that they have. So again, that's that. So I think, but one of the biggest problems really that we're facing with corals is that we've got increasing temperatures and that that's a problem that's going to be much harder to solve. Okay. Um, great answer. Difficult question and something that gets brought up a lot, um, but I'm really glad we got to it today. Uh, all right. Uh, Ms. Leisure's class, you've got a student waiting forever. So I want to go to you guys to make sure he has a chance to ask, and then we'll finish off with Ms. Word time in just a second. So yeah, when your mic's done, demuted, I'll let you know. It'll be good. Sorry for the trouble with that. Wish I could do it myself. Uh, there we go. You're good to go. We are studying giant squids. Have you ever encountered one? I've never seen a giant squid. I'm kind of obsessed with giant squid. I think they're like some of the coolest creatures on the planet, right? I've actually, though, gotten to touch a giant squid tentacle which was really cool because here at the Museum of Natural History in New York, I gave a talk there and they brought out this enormous squid tentacle. 
and it was huge. And the coolest thing was that, you know, on a you're studying them, so you'll know, but they've got the arms and then they've got these suckers on them. And they were like this big. Hey, that's huge. Right. And then they've got like the little teeth on them. So I've never seen one. It'd be like one of my ultimate dreams to see one in the wild, obviously. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why I keep wanting to go see sperm whales in the wild, because I'm hoping one will come up with a giant squid in its mouth and I'll just get that perfect picture and just see that. Um, but in reality, they're just really cool, but also like really firm. Like you don't think about a giant squid tentacle, sort of like what it would feel like. It seems like it'd be kind of squishy, but in reality, it's not. It's like quite firm. Um, so no, I haven't seen one, but it would be really cool too. Quick follow-up. First of all, kudos to a class in grade four for studying giant squids. That's awesome. Uh, for the classes that might not know, uh, Galen, how long is a giant squid? And like, you know, you mentioned you haven't seen them, but in general, I believe we haven't seen many of them ever. Correct? Yeah, no, there's been very few seen in the wild. They actually, um, they finally got footage of one. I don't know. It was just a few years. To see, which is really cool. But they get, you know, I don't know the exact length of them. I think probably the classroom could answer it better than me. Um, but I think it's like 30 feet. Um, something like that. But there's different types of giant squid. So there's like the Architeuthis that are huge. And then you've got, you know, some smaller ones that are um, anywhere ranging. So, but really, really cool, huge, voracious predators of the depths that are one of those ocean mysteries where we used to only see them washing up on shores or in fishing nets. And then we finally got some footage of them live recently, which is really cool. Super cool. All right. Uh, let's finish off with one last question, Miss Word Times class. If you guys want to Come on up and uh, go for it. Yeah, you're good. Have you ever encountered? Have you ever encountered encountered someone falling through the ice on one of your expeditions? Somebody falling through the ice? A person? Yes, actually. And if you um, <laughs> if you want, if you go on my website and you actually watch the sea ice episode that I showed you a clip from, webisode from the Bering Sea Ice Expedition. In our next ice station that we did, because that's just a very small clip, it's about an eight minute um, short. You'll see that um, I don't have footage of him falling in, but I do have the audio because he almost took one of my cameras in with me, with him. And it made me, I was just worried about my camera, and he, but he did fall through, we were on thinner ice and he just stepped in the wrong place. So the day that I showed you the video and I showed you most of the pictures, it was really thick and really safe. Um, and then the following day, uh, it was a little bit less, uh, it was more windy and um, the ice was a little bit less stable, but we wanted to sample that. So you have to be a little bit more careful, but that's why we wear those exposure suits and everything, you know, and they also have flotation in them. So that when he fell through, he just kind of popped, he didn't fall all the way through, he kind of caught himself. And um, and then he kind of floated around a bit and then we pulled him right out. So, you know, that's why we take all of the safety precautions um, to make sure that that, you know, nothing happens that terrible if that does happen, so. Right. Um, to wrap up, thank you. First of all, thank you so, so much. This has been absolutely outstanding uh, as a kickoff coach this weekend and my first time doing hosting with you uh, generally. Uh, is there any last message you want to share with classes where they can learn more, where they can get interested in ocean resources, all of anything else? Yeah, well, absolutely. So if you if you saw anything that you want to learn more about, because obviously this was like super fast, you can check out my two websites. One is just galenrosenwax.com and the other is um, globaloceanexploration.com. So you can like read about all of my expeditions and see more photographs and more videos. Um, and so that's a really great resource. Um, you can also always reach out to me via either social media at Galen Go Explore or on my or through Facebook um, or through my websites and send me qu any questions that you guys have following up. Feel free to send them to me also on Twitter. Um, and uh, anyway, just have a really great World Oceans Week. Happy World Oceans Day. Um, it's so exciting for me that, you know, through my career, we're actually celebrating it on a global scale, that we actually have a week to celebrate the ocean is so exciting. And I think just to make sure that everything that you think about, I think the plastics thing is you know, try to think about this week, what you individually can do to, you know, have an impact positively on the earth and to, you know, and the oceans. And thank you so much for joining me this morning. Outstanding. Well, at the end of every hangout, what we're going to do, boys and girls, uh, if you guys can get ready, I'm going to demute everyone's microphones. So if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Galen for joining us today. Uh, everyone is now...
is now demuted. So demuted. Awesome, guys. To all our classes, thank you so much for such great questions and enthusiasm. We look forward to having you back soon. And Galen, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so, 